Hello, and welcome back to my continuing series on world government UFO disclosure. Today's installment comes to you courtesy of the United States. Uh, now, I do have an awful lot, or could delve into an awful lot of information. There is such a rich history in the United States of documented material. Due to time constraints uh, within this video, uh, I'm going to just uh, give you some of the uh, more significant highlights in terms of history, uh, contributors, disclosure activities, and uh, the number of U.S. agencies, uh, government agencies that are involved. So without further ado, let me jump right into some fun facts about the United States. Uh, the population currently is roughly about 334 million people. That represents uh, a little under 4% of the total world's population. Now the United States uh, has always been a major influencer in the world landscape of disclosure and uh, the uh, UFO, UAP, ETI phenomenon. So uh, the uh, U.S. government does behave and act similarly to, uh, as we've, uh, as you've come to find, or maybe have not, uh, Australia's uh, government and uh, a policy, uh, where there's uh, a lot of secrecy going on, but there has been an awful lot of extensive uh, disclosure by the government. In addition to uh, some files either being withheld or or lost uh, by uh, reported uh, by various uh, government agencies within both countries. So Australia and the U.S. parallel each other on uh, most more of the important dimensions. Uh, lots of hot spots in the United States, just to uh, capsulize a few of them. Uh, the infamous uh, Area 51 and the regions in southern Nevada. Uh, Arizona, including uh, uh, energy hotspots uh, in the Sedona uh, 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 Verde Valley area, excuse me. Uh, in New Mexico, uh, both around the uh, infamous Roswell area, South Central, and uh, the White Sands Missile Range, which morphs into additional hotspots, including many nuclear uh, Air Force and Army bases uh, throughout, uh, scattered throughout the United States. And there is also, has, but was in uh, history anyways, a, a very important wave and flap in the New York Hudson Valley area where there are both uh, nuclear bases or were nuclear bases and also nuclear uh, generating electricity power plants. So amongst uh, many others, but those are some of the significant ones. So let's uh, jump into the history of uh, the phenomenon and the reporting and uh, witnessing of such. Uh, this actually goes back to most people don't uh, recognize that Native America, through their rock writings, uh, including pictographs and petroglyphs, uh, recorded uh, many events to do with what uh, they called, for lack of a better word, star people. And uh, these rock writings is, uh, is a very uh, also current major deep dive study research effort of myself uh, and will be ongoing for the next few years. Uh, many uh, recordings have been made that span back going, uh, we estimate, over eight to 10,000 years ago. So let's uh, fast forward into uh, colonization and more modern efforts. In 1639, uh, Cotton Mather uh, did his own first uh, reporting outside of Boston, Massachusetts. In 1776, uh, then uh, General, a military general, George Washington at the Battle of Bailey Forge had a very significant uh, incident uh, sighting of his own, which uh, helped him to uh, redraw the battle strategy for the ba uh, Battle of Valley Forge and caused the revolutionary forces to uh, produce a victory at that war, uh, at that battle and uh, the subsequent war. Uh, many, many uh, from George Washington, many, many U.S. presidents, including most of those in the 20th century, uh, were also involved in during their terms of office and some as private citizens um, with the uh, UAP activity. In 1933, there's been a uh, long time running a suspected, uh, speculated activity with President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to do with uh, what was called a, the Grenada Treaty, in which it's suspected that he did sign some kind of a secret agreement with uh, extraterrestrial forces of some time. Uh, again, this is speculation. There's been no definitive enduring 
uh, proof of this. So, uh, but keep tuned. There may come uh, more in the near future. Uh, in September 1941, just before the U.S. entered World War II, Cape Girardeau, Missouri, was the site of a crash and retrieval by the U.S. Army of suspected ET bodies. Then a few months later, February 25th, 1942, the Battle of Los Angeles, where the U.S. Army uh, shot uh, over 1,400 rounds of explosives, and uh, many photographs were taken of a suspected aerial craft that seemed oblivious to the explosions of the uh, of the ordnance from uh, that were that was sent up by the uh, U.S. Army. Uh, all throughout World War II, the phenomenon known as Foo Fighters. Uh, was widespread amongst both the Allies and the uh, Axis powers. Uh, on a personal note, my father was a pilot in World War II. Uh, he flew B-17s, and uh, he had a few incidences with these Foo Fighters. So the phenomenon actually did exist and uh, was unexplained by both parties. They thought each other's uh, party had... Uh, had uh, accelerated or advanced uh, technologies that the other that the other forces didn't have so then in uh, July 1947 what's commonly agreed upon is the uh, dawn of the modern age of ufology the Roswell and uh, Corona incidences in New Mexico uh, in uh, July 1952, there was a very, very uh, famous uh, flap uh, wave over Washington, D.C. The last two weeks in July uh, of uh, 52, uh, many, many sightings, documents, and recordings of unidentified aerial craft buzzing around uh, Washington airports, military facilities, and had the entire Capital District in a major uproar for many, many, many weeks thereafter. Uh, the development of Area 51, uh, which uh, is a secret as to its official, uh, the beginning of their construction, but uh, I'm going to throw out a little bit of a, a speculation here. Uh, there's been long time history of the question of how did Area 51 get its name. My guess, and it's only speculation, there's no, there's no uh, backup to my story here, but uh, at the same time in 1951, uh, there was um, a treaty and development between the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. It's called the ANZUS Treaty for America, New Zealand, uh, Australia, New Zealand, U.S. Uh, the U.S. cooperated and was very influential in developing and construction of military facilities in Australia near uh, the uh, Alice Springs and what is called Pine Gap territories in North Central Australia. So this whole relationship began in 1951. Uh, and it's suspected that there is uh, contact uh, communications and networks uh, either uh, in communications or more extensive in the way of physical contacts between uh, the Area 51 and the Pine Gap uh, Alice Springs uh, nuclear bases in Australia. So maybe that's how Area 51 got its name. Who knows? Just a guess. Um, in uh, September of 1960, one, September 20th, the famous Betty and Barney Hill incident in New Hampshire, rural New Hampshire, that uh, kind of helped really uh, cement the longevity of the public display and interest of the UFO UAP phenomenon. Uh, there was very, very heightened and very tense times in the 1950s, but this 1961 incident kind of cemented uh, the, the uh, landscape of enduring interest in the phenomenon. Um, Again, as I mentioned, in the 19, uh, starting in the 1950s and, and actually lasting through to today and ongoing into the future, uh, many U.S. nuclear bases and operations have reams and reams and libraries full of UFO UAP incidences. So uh, 
uh, excuse me, uh, December 9th, 1965, as we continue through our history timeline, uh, the Kecksburg, Pennsylvania incident, where uh, a suspected craft was uh, crashed in uh, western Pennsylvania and retrieved under cloaks of secrecy and many threats to public citizens uh, by the uh, U.S. Uh, Army and uh, the military. Uh, in March of 1966, the last two weeks in March in southern Michigan, there was a wave of documented UFO UAP sightings and uh, kind of produced the, uh, the visit by uh, then uh, U.S. government researcher J. Allen Hynek who toured the area and uh, ultimately made what uh, has been known a popul in popular culture as the swamp gas explanation for what the people of southern Michigan were seeing. There was uh, uh, U.S. Congress, uh, then uh, Senator uh, Gerald Ford, uh, initiated a, uh, a meeting and a summit uh, for the U.S. Congress to uh, study this phenomenon. Uh, as in many uh, government efforts in U.S. history, nothing really much came of this. So a um, lot of paper rattling, that was about it. Uh, in uh, uh, November 5th of 1975, the Travis Walton incident out in Arizona, uh, where uh, a young man, a logger by the name of uh, Travis Walton, was uh, suspected he was uh, abducted and uh, taken by alien spacecraft uh, for a period of five days. And uh, the witnesses, including his construction crew, uh, did subsequently take uh, many polygraph tests, as, as did he. And uh, there has been no the definitive uh, proof of refuting his story. So, uh, in uh, actually, I'm going to back forward a little bit, uh, a couple of years, October uh, the 11th of 1973, we have the Pascagoula, Mississippi incident, where uh, you, two young gentlemen, including uh, Calvin Parker, who's still alive, was uh, abducted and the subject of of uh, much study and a couple of books, in which one just came out a couple of years ago. In fact, March the 20th of 1988. This is uh, this. Uh, case did not get much public exposure, but uh, John Salter was a professor in the North Dakota University system, and he was on his way as a political activist down to New Orleans, where him and his son were abducted in uh, Wisconsin while driving down. Uh, the, uh, there is a very long write-up in uh, my first book, The Humaniverse Guide to Better uh, Reasoning and Decision Making, uh, not only on the John Salter abduction incident, but many of the incidents that I've uh, just mentioned uh, briefly here to you right now. So uh, in March of 1997, the 13th to be exact, we have the Phoenix Lights incident where tens of thousands of people from all walks of life witnessed uh, the slow flying, stationary, hovering uh, aircraft of, of a gigantic size and humongous nature. So just again, a few of the many, many incidents and uh, cases uh, in the U.S. Uh, United States history of the UFO UAP ETI phenomenon. Let me uh, then uh, swing over and mention some of the uh, major uh, significant contributors to this effort uh, in terms of uh, disclosure and uh, reporting and uh, research studying of case histories. Uh, I've mentioned J. Allen Hynek. He was an uh, astronomer researcher hired by the U.S. government in the 1950s. He was a very, very uh, definitive skeptic as a very science-based practical astronomer who had uh, a change of mind throughout his uh, many decades of research, so he kind of became a, uh, the strongest UFO UAP advocate. Other main contributors uh, include uh, the late Stanton Friedman, who uh, uh, kind of crashed the, uh, <laughs> uh, no pun intended, the Roswell and uh, Corona, New Mexico. Uh, UFO cases into the uh, public domain and uh, sparked a new wave of, of popularity starting in the late 1970s. His career lasted through to his death uh, was in 2019, I believe. Uh, Leonard Stringfield, a long time ufology uh, public citizen, ufology archivist, 
who uh, passed away recently, uh, and uh, he had amassed many, many thousands of articles, reports, case histories, and whatnot, so enough for him to be included as a significant contributor. Coral and Jim Lorenzen, who uh, created the uh, Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization, or acronym APRO, back in the early 1950s. Uh, that was around until the uh, very late 1980s and uh, many, uh, it was a newsletter type of a thing similar to what the upcoming MUFON organization has. Uh, but, but much history, uh, much um, research and uh, documented information archives that are still available readily uh, right now. Uh, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, or NICAP acronym, uh, began in the 1950s, as did the uh, APRO uh, organization. Uh, NICAP is still around today, although mostly in an archival library uh, source, but um, again, very significant and overly extensive uh, body of research information and for your study and uh, perusal if you if you so wish to. Uh, the National Archives, which uh, if you've uh, looked at my other videos, uh, you've m heard me mention the National Archives as often as any other organization. Uh, their website uh, under the um, under the section on identified flying objects, you're going to find uh, an, uh, a very rich resource, many, many thousands of pages, and uh, being added to very actively as time goes on. Uh, other uh, U.S. government um, uh, contributors, main contributors, uh, especially recent efforts, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the uh, Central Intelligence Agency, uh, and uh, also too, I'm putting these, as you've seen here, I'm putting some of these uh, websites uh, up on my screen here. I will also have them available on my Facebook page, The Humaniverse. So if you don't feel comfortable taking down some of these website uh, addresses here, uh, refer I refer you over to my Facebook page, The Humaniverse. You can get those website addresses there and you can uh, uh, link to uh, any of these departments, any of these libraries and archival resources that you wish. There's an awful lot of them. But uh, again, as I mentioned here, uh, the um, NICAP.org uh, is one of them, the National Archives, and uh, the uh, U.S. government's Federal Bureau of Investigation, and also the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. Uh, additionally, too, the National Security Agency, or NSA, uh, is also another uh, agency that has a body of records and files for uh, for study and for research purposes. Uh, more uh, private citizen uh, efforts and uh, public ufologists. Uh, John Greenewald, uh, you've heard me mention his, uh, his expansive uh, website, The Black Vault, certainly a source and archival of not only U.S. but uh, other worldwide information. Uh, the MUFON organization, Mutual UFO Network, that is the one of the boots on the ground organizations that actually does active case studies when new reports, new incidences uh, come in. Uh, the, the witnesses are encouraged to uh, get in touch with the MUFON people. They'll send research investigators out there to do case studies. Uh, David McDonald is the current director, uh, U.S. director of the uh, MUFON uh, organization. Also, too, in the U.S., we have National UFO Reporting Center, or NewFork.org. Uh, David, uh, Peter Davenport, I'm sorry, is the uh, current uh, operator, and they, they operate, they run quite a bit like the MUFON organization, except without the active field investigator dimension of it. So if you're in the U.S. and you have a sighting to report, you can report it to New Fork National UFO Reporting Center, uh, and uh, and they'll take they'll take a written statement from you. But uh, for more boots on the ground, it's the MUFON organization that's the uh, most extensive one to date. Also, too, the North Ontario UFO Research Study or New Fours. Uh, again, if you've listened to some of my other videos, you've heard uh, the New Fours uh, acronym being mentioned. Also, uh, worldwide uh, uh, archives of, of much information from other countries. And two, lastly, we do have uh, the National Aeronautic and Space Administration, NASA, 
Um, while they, they will have some, some uh, information on the topic, you're not going to find an awful lot in terms of case studies and whatnot from them. They are just the uh, one of the science wings, so to speak here. So, and then also too, I want to sh uh, put a shout out mention to, uh, a U.S. Uh, radio long time, a uh, program. It's called coast to coast AM. It's a uh, run overnight. And, um, it started actually uh, not under Coast to Coast acronym, but in the 19, late 1970s, Larry King, a uh, longtime uh, radio host, did his own radio show and had very many, uh, very many episodes on the UFO phenomenon. And then uh, he he took that into the 1980s, and then, and then the Coast to Coast. AM acronym took over where uh, personalities such as, uh, uh, again, Larry King, Art Bell, and uh, currently George Norrie is the uh, the moderator and the host for the Coast to Coast AM program. So uh, let me morph uh, now into the uh, list of agencies. Again, I'm just going to shave off uh, some of the more significant ones. The U.S. has a very extensive web of uh, contributing agencies to this effort, uh, including the United States Army, Navy and Air Force and uh, the U.S. Space Force, which was newly created just a short few years ago. Uh, as I've mentioned, the Central Intelligence Agency, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the National Security Agency, or NSA, the Army Intelligence, the Coast Guard, the Air Force Office of Intelligence, AFOIN, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, the Air Force Science Advisory Board, the aforementioned National Aeronautic and Space Administration, the U.S. Department of Defense, and the U.S. Department of National Intelligence. Boy, that's a mouthful, huh? But uh, like I said, those are some of the main contributors to the um, U.S. government's efforts here. So. Uh, as in terms of disclosure, there wasn't really, uh, again, with uh, only with the the creation of the current age of the study of ufology, uh, starting with the uh, the uh, Roswell Corona incidences and the uh, Kenneth Arnold sightings. Uh, back uh, just a few weeks before Roswell in June 1947. So uh, that uh, christened our culture, christened the new age of uh, ufology and uh, UFO study basically as of that date. But uh, the U.S. government, again, uh, wasn't or uh, became very, very much involved very secretively, uh, at least uh, not uh, entirely transparent and not immediately transparent. So in 1949, the U.S. had uh, Project saucer underway which is also known as project sign that lasted for about 18 months or so when uh, project grudge uh, opened up when project saucer closed then the next year project blue book is the famous one that has the longest track record started in 1952 edward ruppel uh, uh captain was the um was the lead of that particular office and uh, the the project blue book did last until 1969 when the uh, infamous condon report came out with the summary book of the phenomenon and conclusions drawn from the u.s's study of it so uh in 1952 and 53 uh, 41 UFO reports were released to uh, uh, then researcher Donald Kehoe. That began the long string of uh, dribbling of information and reports, uh, either by the government willingly or as significantly, if not more, from the efforts of the ufology community in the United States and uh, private citizens and uh, researcher and uh, study efforts by, uh, by uh, U.S. citizens. So um, every year from 1953 through 69, the U.S. Air Force did publish an annual UFO report summary, but again, uh, it was subject to very, very much, uh, how will I put this, uh, non-transparency or or a very uh, not much was even being revealed. Back at that time, the U.S. government was 
desperately trying to influence the public to lose interest in the phenomenon. Uh, they were claiming back at that time that there was no threat to national security, that, uh, that the public should be concerned with more different things, at least anyways, than uh, searching for UFOs and, and reporting UFOs. The uh, government did have a reporting office the early days of Project Blue Book. It got overwhelmed within months and began the the strategy of the U.S. to then try and debunk and dissociate themselves away from the USO phenomenon. But uh, the annual UFO report was published every year by the Air Force through 1969. Now in 1963 uh, through 67, this was an effort by then very young uh, ufology researcher and astronomer, actually Jacques Vallée. He worked closely with Alan Hynek for a long time too in the UFO uh, UAP uh, ETI study. Uh, he had access to some, many summaries and different papers from Project Blue Book that maybe some of the general public did not have. In 1966, uh, the uh, Freedom of Information Act became law and legislation. So that was a that was a new uh, new development which opened the door for much public uh, effort to be established and conducted by uh, the open field of ufology community researchers here. So. Uh, the Blue Book status reports 1 through 12 also in 1966 were released to the NICAP organization. So uh, in 1970, full Blue Book archives were declassified, but uh, many of them, as was the standard course of the U.S. Uh, Air Force and uh, government agencies, uh, the, the phenomenon of redacting of uh, printed articles where they uh, information is obliterated out that became common practice and still continues to this day so as uh, I move forward here uh, 1974 through 77 the CIA released a hundred plus pages of UFO policy and analysis uh, analysis memos uh, in 1976 uh, the uh, Blue Book uh, redacted files were actually made available to the National Archives organization, which then eventually, when uh, the digital technology became available, put them up online for the public to see. In 1977 and 78, uh, the FBI released 2,000 pages under Freedom of Information Act, and the CIA released about 900 pages under that same FOIA, F-O-I-A Act, uh, also, in 1980, the Army Intelligence UFO files were released under more Freedom of Information Act requests. In 1992, the NSA released 204 pages of heavily redacted UFO documents under FOIA lawsuit. In uh, 1997, uh, various uh, Maxwell Air Force Base uh, files were released. Uh, Maxwell Air Force Base had been an ongoing uh, source of many sightings and uh, in, in, incident reports and whatnot throughout uh, many decades in the latter part of the 20th century. So, uh, in 1998, the Army Intelligence and Security Command UFO files released uh, 900 pages under FOIA request again also. Um, as I move uh, further on here, uh, in uh, 2000, the CIA, CIA uh, placed 300 UFO docs online, which contri contrived of about a thousand pages. Uh, in uh, 2004, the FBI placed all their FOIA UFO documents online, and uh, the NSA uh, placed uh, did the same similar uh, activity and placed uh, hundreds of their UFO documents online. Uh, the Department of Intelli Defense Intelligence Agency uh, also in 2004 placed 292 pages of FOIA UFO documents uh, at their particular website under uh, FOIA, uh, Freedom of Information Act. Um, around 2007, I, I have to mention this, the uh, U.S. government started uh, getting wise uh, with the deluge of, of uh, freedom of information requests that were being sent into them and the pressure being put onto them, uh, they developed a new strategy in which 
uh, from then, uh, future projects uh, of the uh, UFO UAP nature were subcontracted out to private contracting organizations, and this circumvented the legalities of the uh, Freedom of Information Act, were that it then now became almost impossible for the public and any other ufology researchers to successfully file a FOIA uh, request and actually receive the documents in question. So that uh, strategy does continue through to today. That started around 2007. Uh, in November of uh, 2010, the FBI released 1,600 pages of UFO documents online. As you can see here, this is development of uh, their dribbling. It's kind of like I've uh, in my uh, in my discussions, long time history. I have this water drip theory where if you take a swimming pool and the government will disclose uh, drips of water to help fill that swimming pool, well, that's kind of what's going on here with um, the um, the uh, FOIA uh, the FOIA phenomenon and the disclosure of uh, ufology information. Uh, also, too, then around 2010, 15,000 pages of C CIA OSC. UFO reports were actually withheld. Uh, they were, again, redacted, the very popular phenomenon that uh, the U.S. government uses. So they actually uh, recalled some files, so to speak, after releasing them. So that has gone on, too, from the various U.S. Uh, government agencies uh, on a much smaller scale from 2010 and continues that activity today. So fast forward, uh, the last few years in the U.S., uh, in uh, 2017, the uh, explosion uh, of uh, the acknowledgement of the existence of the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP, uh, which was uh, broke to the uh, public, and subsequently more information released that uh, the U.S. did have a study in place, the ATIP program, that began in 2007, continued, uh, they said, originally until 2012, but it was known to have existed through at least 2007. 17 and it's expected that it continues on through to today and into the future so uh, from that a tip disclosure the many videos of uh, the US Navy reports and incidences and uh, uh, stories revolving around that uh, this uh, particular landscape event uh, it, it actually helped in one way in that the U.S. government did change its course of action. Remember way back when I mentioned in the 1950s that uh, they were trying to, the government was trying to uh, dispel the public away from following UFOs, UAPs. Uh, reasoning or, or describing that they, they pose no threat to national security. That's the one big difference with the 2021 announcement is that the U.S. government did finally admit that, well, yes, these things do pose a national security threat. In my book, that represents a very major advance of the position by the U.S. government uh, even though it took over 70 years for them to finally admit that. But uh, so far in the couple of years since then, uh, this phenomenon has not uh, decreased in terms of staying power or popularity. Uh, the U.S. government it has also promoted, too, the... Um, disclosure of some more reports. Uh, the last uh, 18 months, uh, fi over 500 uh, UAP reports have been uh, have been released by the Office of uh, the Director of National Intelligence. And in 2023, the national uh, legislation, uh, the uh, Congress legislated the National Defense Authorization Act, which includes study and regular report dissemination of the UAP phenomenon. Also, too, as I mentioned before, uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, then President Trump did sign into legislation the uh, existence and creation of the United States Space Force, which is the sixth U.S. government military agency to actually exist. So uh, much information here. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up now with uh, quick conclusion remarks. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, circling back to the to uh, my beginning remarks, uh, the U.S. government has been has a very very rich detailed history. We all know that they've been a very major influencer on other world governments disclosure activities or lack of them we know that 
the U.S. government's behavior of these uh, of their disclosure uh, activities and lack of them, and the the evolution and the course of actions that they wish to have chosen all throughout these times. If I had to pick one country that most mirrors the U.S. activities in all of these regards on many different levels and factors, it has to be Australia, in that uh, they both were uh, very reluctant at first to release, uh, basically describing that, well, they, they didn't really study the phenomenon, and then eventually they admitted that they did. They wrote reports and then said that they weren't going to be in the uh, UFO UAP field anymore. Uh, there have been reports, uh, again, very, very active uh, freedom of information uh, um, activities in both countries. And both countries have uh, come out with announcements that they've lost files all of a sudden that, uh, that were at once thought to have existed or whatnot. And that could be due to the overwhelming bureaucracy and all of the listed agencies involved from both governments if i encourage you actually go over to my australia installment on world government disclosure and you're going to get a feel there for for them so i'd say uh the u.s uh, landscape uh, most mirrors that of australia on on uh, many different dimensions and also too that they have both have a very rich public ufology community of many many researchers and studiers that have uh, that have put in tireless and many many hours in doing this so uh, that's uh, that's it for me from uh, the US here so I encourage you to go through my other uh, my other episodes and also too uh, as you go through them and then tune in to my final episode I'm gonna have a review video summing up the uh, landscape of the world government in regards to UFO disclosure I'm Keith thank you very much for listening and uh, we'll talk to you next time bye now